Hey folks, today we're going to talk a little bit about files and file sizes so you can start to understand how to, to work with your files and folders, things of that nature, and how to know when files are very small, when they're too large, and things like that, because they can have a profound effect on what you do with your computer if you're trying to do something like email out a file attachment, but the file may be too large or something like that, or you may want to try to print a file, like a, a JPEG or a photograph, and you find out that when you print it, it comes out real fuzzy and blocky and, and not very good quality. So the first thing you need to understand about files uh, that I like to teach are the file names. And so when you look at a file that to name, there's two parts to it. To the left of the period, and this is at the basic form, you can have multiple periods in file names today, but for the most part, people stick to this standard. And that uh, is that you have one period in the file name and to the left of it is actually the file name. And then to the right of the period is the extension. And the extension is usually three characters. Sometimes it's one or two or four, but usually it's three. And back in uh, the early days of computers, before we had 32-bit operating systems and we dealt with DOS, um, and you know or earlier things like Windows 3.1, you would have what was called an 8.3 naming conventions. So on the left of this period would be a file name that could be up to eight characters, one to eight characters, and then to the right of that would be up to three characters for the extension. Uh, for example, you may have a file called document.doc, D-O-C, and the doc extension is typically associated with Microsoft Word. Now, newer versions of Microsoft Word are docx, or if it's an Excel spreadsheet, it's xlsx, so it's four characters. So when you look at your file names and folder names, uh, you know, pretty easy to identify. You know, to the left of that is the file name, to the right of it is the extension. Now, why is the extension important? The extension is typically what it is associated with. Like I said, the doc or docx or Word documents, XLS, X for Excel. Uh, if you're dealing with images, they may be, may be what's called JPEGs or JPGs, GIF or GIFs, uh, PNG for uh, graphic files, and so, uh, that way you know how to identify what types of files you're working with. And in Windows, by default, the extensions are usually hidden. So I'll go on to the computer and I'll show you how to reveal those and be able to tell what you're working with as well. Um, so, now we get into file sizes. And so, when it comes to the file sizes, what's important to understand is I guess the relation and where things started at. So when you look at a character, one character is typically one byte. So if you were to type a letter in Notepad, it's a very simple editor, uh, and save it, the letter A, that's going to use one byte of storage. So if you have a thousand characters, you have 1,024 actually is one kilobyte or KB for short. You go up to what is really a thousand kilobytes you would have a megabyte. Now it wouldn't be exactly a million because it would be uh, 1024 uh, because the uh, one kilobyte is actually 1024. Uh, so uh, then you get to the relationships of one kilobyte, one, excuse me, megabyte, then one gigabyte. When we talk about uh, the relationship between file sizes, between small, large files, um, you can go back to uh, one of the things uh, that 
a lot of us have used in the past are floppy disks. This is a three and a half inch floppy disk. This was an older five and a quarter inch floppy disk. And a lot of people used to call these hard disks. I've mentioned that before. This is actually a floppy disk. The hard disk is actually a little device that's inside your computer. Or you can have external hard drives today. So uh, we'll take a look first at this five and a quarter inch floppy disk. It would hold 1.2 megabytes of data. So 1.2 million bytes of data. The three and a half inch floppy disk would hold 1.44 megabytes of data. Okay. Now today, when we talk about our hard drives and, and CDs and DVDs, everything starts to grow exponentially because files are a lot larger. Uh, picture files are a lot more detailed than what they used to be. So when you go up to a CD, those are 650 megabytes. A DVD is about 5 gigabytes. I think it's actually 5.4, something like that. I don't know off the top of my head. And then you get into your hard drives, or hard disk drive, and those are gigabytes up to terabytes. So if you think of the relationship in um, terms of a thousand, you have kilobytes, and then a thousand kilobytes is a megabyte or a million, and then you go up to gigabytes which is a thousand megabytes or billions. And then you got to terabytes, which a thousand gigabytes is a terabyte or a trillion. Okay, so we're starting to talk about a lot of large numbers there. Now, um, the differences in these uh, types of media, the floppy disks, of course, could be read and written to. So you could save things on them, delete them, put new things on them, and so forth. A CD is typically write only if it's a CD-ROM. So if you go buy software and it comes on a CD, that is burned onto the CD and you can't change it. It's just like a CD, music CD that you put in your car. Now, later on, many years ago, they started to introduce uh, the CD-ROM drives and the CD-RWs where you could actually write your own CD drives and then you could also get uh, CD-RWs which could read and write and you could kind of treat them like a uh, floppy disk and you could put things on them, delete them off and, and all that kind of stuff. DVDs, uh, same thing, they were read only then they went to DVD-RWs where you could save things on them and take them off again. And then the hard drive, of course, is full read-write uh, at, at its basic level. You can, of course, set permissions to prevent uh, things from being written onto and everything. But for the sake of this discussion, we'll talk about uh, saving and deleting and writing and changing and all that kind of stuff. So out of these devices, these are actually the slowest things in your computer, believe it or not. Um, floppy disks, of course, are extremely slow. CDs, DVDs, faster, but still pretty slow. And then the hard drive is pretty slow. It's, you know, they're very fast, but they're pretty slow compared to the rest of your system, compared to your CPU memory and all that. So that's why I, you know, in some of my other videos I'll talk about if your processor's slow or you don't have enough memory, you'll notice that your hard drive runs a lot and that causes your system to be slow because your system can only run as fast as what that hard drive will allow it to run. Okay, and so it's a mechanical device. And then today you get into SSDs or solid state drives, which those aren't mechanical devices. They're like huge banks of memory that can store and read and write uh, data. And they're much faster than a traditional hard drive, but they're more expensive for equivalent forms of uh, storage. So if you buy, compare a uh, 250 gig solid state drive to a 250 gig regular hard drive, it'll be more expensive. So why are all these things important that I'm telling you? That is because when you try to do file operations, you need to understand your file sizes. So again, when I go over to the computer, I'll show you this uh, information as well. But you'll have the file name, and then in columns, you'll have different details. 
you'll have the size and typically the type of file that it is. And I'll show you this on, on Windows, of course. So you may have a file called document. The size may say 500 kilobytes. And then the type may say Word document. And so when you're talking about 500 kilobytes, that's a half of a megabyte. Okay. If you remember, 1.44 megabytes on one of these little guys. So you could store two of these files on there, but not a third one, because that would be 1.5 be larger than 1.44. Hope that hopefully that makes sense to you. Now, when it comes to doing things with your files, like emailing them to someone or emailing them a picture or an image, you need to understand the file sizes. I had a client several years ago who called me one day and they said, our email server is down. We can't do anything. Every time we go into Outlook, it just locks up on us. And so what I, uh, I went in, I had to do a little bit of troubleshooting investigation, found out that someone had a uh, cute little video they were trying to send by email. This was before YouTube days. And uh, they sent the, e the video as an attachment, and that video file was 70 megabytes. So uh, roughly about, uh, about 40 or 50 of these disks would be required to put that one file on. And their email system took it, and it just kept turning and turning and turning, and eventually it just went down because it couldn't handle the size of the file. So most modern email systems have limitations on them. My personal recommendation is I try not to email out any file that's larger than 5 to 10 megabytes. Uh, there's reasons for that. One, it can take a while to send. But two, the recipient, uh, especially if they don't know you're sending a file, it's a courtesy to them. Because if you do a broadcast, say you get something funny, you send it on to 20 of your friends by email, and it's a 10 megabyte file, you've really kind of sent them an unexpected large attachment. You know, I consider it junk mail. So, uh, and it, it could take a while for them to download it, and it's, it can be frustrating. So, Gmail, if I'm not mistaken, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but Gmail sets an upper limit on email attachments at 20 megabytes. So, anything over 20 megabytes, it will reject it and send it back or to the, to the sender, or uh, if it was from outside, it will just reject it and not accept it at all as well. Microsoft... Uh, with Outlook.com, Hotmail, and all their offerings, I believe is a 25 megabyte. At least that's what it is on the business class uh, uh, the exchange hosting that they offer for business email. So I would never personally send anyone an email that large unless there was no alternative. Um, but, um, you know, th that way you understand what you're working with. When it comes to pictures, uh, you can take a, and to give you an, an idea of the advancement of technology, 1.44 megabytes, we used to put, you know, literally hundreds of files on one of these disks. And uh, it used to have a, you know, a whole box, a little file cabinet of these disks that stored our data on them. And today, a cell phone camera, uh, this one, this is a Samsung Galaxy S5, and the pictures that I take with it are absolutely stunning and they are about four megabytes in size, so it would take uh, about three of these to store one photograph from my cell phone camera today on this uh, disk. And that four megabyte picture would be the upper limit of an image that I would email to someone. And I wouldn't email them someone a, a picture that large if they weren't requesting it for print quality or something like that. So uh, now on the other side of the coin, if you look at a picture, uh, you know, I have people send me pictures all the time that would say, can you put this, print this, and put it on a uh, glass block or something like that. And uh, I'll get the picture, and it'll say it's 30 kilobytes. And what happens is this might be a picture that's old of the person, and the picture was taken 12 years ago with a little flip phone camera. And those come out very fuzzy and very poor quality. And then when you expand the size of that picture to print quality it's just not viewable it's just very fuzzy and, and doesn't work out so uh, you have to be careful uh, when trying to upsize pictures you'll typically run into that if you take a bunch of pictures and you upload them to Walmart or Walgreens or something for uh, uh, to have them put on uh, you know actual photographs and uh, when you get them you look through them you'll see one that's really fuzzy really hard to see that's why it's because that was a very low resolution very small picture 
Now, SVG files are quite a bit different than a regular image file. SVG files are really code, or if you were to open one of those files up and look at it inside of something like Notepad, you would see a bunch of what's called XML data, if you're familiar with that. And that data basically tells it how to draw the lines on the screen for you. And so I looked at my list of SVG files, and where as um, a picture from my phone is four megabytes in size. My SVG library, the files range from about one kilobyte to 150 kilobytes in size. So there's quite a bit of difference between SVGs and image files like JPEGs, PNG files, and so forth. So hopefully that helps you understand some of those file size relationships and how to manage those file sizes. I'm going to switch over to the computer real quick and show you how to show those file extensions that are normally hidden in Windows and uh, hopefully that will help you out a little bit. As I mentioned in Windows, the default view does not show the file extensions. So when I'm looking at a folder of files, I can see the file name, but I cannot see the extension. And then I have columns which show the date, the file type, and the size. So what I can do, one thing I can do is I can go to the view menu and I can choose to view my uh, files in different formats. So if I want to see the details, which will show me all of these columns, I can choose details. If I want to see thumbnails, I can go to large icons or medium icons and see small thumbnails of the images themselves. So I'll go back to file and view details. And what I want to change is under the tools menu, I go to folder options. Now this is Windows 7. Under Windows 8, I believe it might be under the file menu, but you want to get to this folder options dialog box and go to the view tab and on the view tab there is an option called hide extensions for known file types so if I uncheck that box and click OK you'll see now that it shows the PNG and JPEG extensions on the files that you see on my screen and that can be handy just to, so that you can easily identify the types of files that you're working with if you're interested in my support services or consulting services, please visit my website at www.troyyoung.com for most current pricing information. Additionally, you can go to patreon.com slash troyyoung to help support my channel. Hopefully my video has been helpful to you. If it has been, please subscribe to my channel and by all means, please share my videos.